In the book of Proverbs, chapter 14 and verse 34, the scripture says this, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Now, in this verse, God draws a direct correlation between a nation marked by a generally righteous culture and righteous citizens, resulting in national prestige and honor and respect from other nations. By contrast, this verse declares that a nation marked by a generally wicked culture and citizens, characterized by sinful living, will yield national disgrace and shame and disrespect from other nations. Now, in another location in Proverbs, chapter 29 and verse 2, the scripture draws a further and more personal correlation to righteous versus wicked nations when it says this, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. Now, in this verse, the Bible says that, that national righteousness or national wickedness is directly connected to the lives and actions of those in political leadership within the nation. Now, if the people in office in their lives, in their persons, and public choices are righteous, the citizens of the nation will rejoice because God will bless and the nation will be exalted. But if the leaders in office are wicked and in their personal lives live sinfully and in their public actions make decisions and laws which reflect wickedness and sin, the people will mourn and God will cause the nation to devolve into one without respect and will be cursed of God. Now, in today's program, Dr. Isaac Crockett and I will discuss in brief the further meaning of these two verses and what righteousness and wickedness mean, and how one can identify a righteous and a wicked leader, and how this relates to America today in the midst of our wicked culture and our time of election of leaders. Our title for today's program is this, When the Righteous Are in Authority. All right, Isaac, these are verses that a lot of people would know, probably, but haven't thought a whole lot about it. But certainly we're in a time in America right now where they're very appropriate, yes, <laughs> very relevant. So let's get into it. Let's, why don't you take Proverbs 14.34. Um, the word righteousness is used and sin is used. Uh, and like we've learned in many of our programs, we talk about defined terms. So mm -hmm. But define righteousness. What's that mean generally as used in this verse and sin as it's used generally in this verse? This is good timing because um, I'm teaching a class for Vacation Bible School <laughs> this summer at church. And uh, I'll just give you quickly what I defined it as last night in, in, in our Bible school class to the uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. And that is that righteousness is doing what God says is right and sin is, uh, is disobedience which you could say disobe disobeying God's rules or a transgression against God's laws. Now, um, I'll refer to the longer uh, full uh, definitions from the Webster's 1828, which is kind of our go-to uh, dictionary. And the definition for righteousness, according to Webster's 1828, um, it says that it's purity of heart and rectitude of life. It's a conformity of heart and life to the, the, the divine law. Um, it says that it's used in scripture and in theology uh, to be equivalent to holiness or comprehending holy principles and affections of the heart. It goes back to that conformity issue, conformity of life to the divine law. It includes justice, honesty, virtue, holy affections. In short, it is true religion. This is according to Webster's 1828 for the definition of righteousness. Uh, defining sin, going to the same Webster's 1828, it is the voluntary departure of a moral agent from a known rule of rectitude or duty prescribed by God. Any voluntary transgression of the divine law, a violation of a divine command, a wicked act, iniquity, uh, and it goes on to say that sin can be either a positive act, something you're doing wrong, uh, or one that is a voluntary neglect of something you should have done. Um, and it goes on, it says, sin comprehends not action only, but neglect of known duty 
all evil thoughts, purposes, words, and desires, whatever is contrary to God's commands or law. And so as we talk about you know, righteousness and sin, uh, Jesus, he talked about that. He called people to righteousness. John the Baptist called people to righteousness. And, and so the two, they do not go together. They are <laughs> diametrically opposed from each other. In fact, in, in Jesus' sermon um, in Matthew chapter 6, we often refer to, he tells us to seek first the kingdom of God. And unfortunately, uh, many people are not doing that. We're all seeking a kingdom, either to build our own kingdom or a national kingdom or some, you know, our boss's kingdom. But to actually seek God's kingdom, he says, then it will be also in the righteousness of God. And uh, if we, we ignore that, then we will be sinning, we'll be disobeying God's laws, that God's rules. So that, that's what we want to talk about today. When the righteous are in authority, uh, how that goes as opposed to when sin reigns in our lives. So we're going to take a quick time out. We'll be right back on Stand in the Gap. Truth, flexible or permanent. The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant. Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs. The pastor, commentator, or frontline combatant. Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping. This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Watch Lighthouse TV wherever you go. Available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. You can view our in-house studio productions on demand or watch what's on the station right now with our 24 seven live stream. Search Lighthouse TV online on your streaming device or go to our website for more information. Visit lighthousetv.org to stay connected. There you can find out what's currently on the air and coming up. How to watch in your area on cable, satellite, broadcast, or streaming devices. Watch past programs or our live stream. Follow us on social media and learn more about the station, our hosts, and our programming. Lighthouse TV, positively different. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap. And today we're looking at uh, what it takes for the righteous to be in authority and, and what the difference is. And Sam, I, I want to actually just take a trip down uh, memory lane just a little bit when both of us were quite a bit younger than we are right now. Uh, less gray hairs on both of us and things. And I remember... Well, at least on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, me too. Uh, I was pastoring in Berks County. You were my representative. And I, and I remember different times you getting together with some of us pastors and some godly uh, uh, government leaders, yourself included, and, and you called it ministers together. And uh, you would go through different passages with us and we would you know listen to, to some things about it. And one of the passages is that when you, you quoted earlier, uh, Proverbs 29, 2, that when the righteous are in authority, there's rejoicing going on. But the, the exact opposite happens. There's mourning when they're not. Um, could you maybe apply this, maybe give us some lessons? Because I know you can, because I've, I've sat under your teaching, even as a pastor, it was very helpful uh, about what this passage means. Uh, I can, Isaac, and I remember that. And it was a few years ago. <laughs> but... Uh, Thank the Lord that uh, He's been faithful to us. You know, um, when I look at that verse, and I have it here right in front of me, I'm going to read it again. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. There are a lot of places I could go, but you know, there's, there's one principle I think that's very apparent right here. This verse and anywhere else in Scripture, I do not find that God um, divides rulers or those in authority, into any other categories hmm. other than two, righteous, wicked. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's significant because in our age, particularly as Americans, most what, watching the program, although this program's in Europe, they'll be able to identify too when they see it. Um, 
we tend to uh, label people or divide our rulers into I like them or I don't like them. Republican or Democrat, conservative or liberal, left or right, progressive or whatever, you know what I mean? But, 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 but God does not look at those things. To him, those are terms almost without significance. Mm. He cuts to the quick and says, righteous or wicked. So the more we think like God, the better off we're going to be. So that's one, two categories of people. And, um, and, uh, and on other programs that we've talked about, uh, recently we did a program on choosing to choose. I guarantee you every person in a position of authority has chosen to be where they are. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the second point is that these types of people clearly from here and other parts of Scripture are not, they don't earn that label or that title, righteous or wicked, um, because of who they are. This has nothing to do with gender. It has nothing to do with race. It has nothing to do with nationality. So somebody could be sitting in China, and this is going to apply to them, or Japan, or Russia, or Europe, or the United States. God, it doesn't make any difference to him, those divisions. God makes his determination of righteous or wicked based on how we know God judges people, Mm. how they think in their heart, and how they conform, as you read the definition, righteous, how they perform uh, their behavior. Are they holy? Are they honest? Do they exhibit virtue actions? Okay, that, that's the second one. And the third thing is that there, I think we can pull from here and all other places in Scripture, that there is a direct relationship. Mm. And I think this is really critical, as in choices and consequences that we've talked about before. There's a direct relationship between the citizens of a nation who are not afraid to walk out in the street, who can own private property, who can work and not have everything taken in taxation, Mm -hmm. um, who can raise their children in the fear and admonition of the Lord without being threatened of being taken to jail, who can communicate without... uh, being afraid that some government entity is going to say what you said is not uh, permissible, as an example. Um, Those people who live in a nation where the rulers, the authority, is righteous, doing things that are right, as you said, the result is that the people are going to rejoice. They'll be blessed. But if the wicked bear rule, then they mourn because there are very poor, bad consequences that, uh, that go to it. There's misery. Misery and mourning mark the attitude. And when we look around the world, how many nations today live in misery mm-hmm. because they live under tyrannical, ungodly, clearly wicked rule? And frankly, even here, I'm going to say in America, how we once recall there was a far lot more rejoicing on the part of people because of what the rulers were like than I'm going to say to what it is now. So there's a change in this. But that direct relationship, those are the three principles I think we at least Mm -hmm. pull out of this verse. Well, I'm going to do something to you that you do to a lot of folks on our radio program, Stay in the Gap today. I'm going to ask you uh, for a definition that you could take hours to give us and you only have minutes. Um, But could you give us, uh, uh, define what is meant by a righteous person being in authority? And, And again, I know you could preach on that for more time than we have. but Well, uh, I, I can. And there's two aspects. Very quickly, righteous, if a person is a believer and they've trusted Jesus Christ, they have been justified, declared righteous. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. one is a righteous position before God that mm-hmm. is only achievable in salvation. Mm-hmm. But what we see most of the time and what's being talked about here is really how they live. Mm. How they live. Um, In a politician, it's the laws that they pass. It's the regulations that they support. It's what they say. But I'm going to take that to authority within a home. Mm. Because parents who live as authority in the home live righteously 
their children will rejoice. But if they live ungodly, the children will not rejoice because they can't. But the same thing for an employer or anybody in a position of, uh, of authority. So I'm going to say those two things. Now, now there's, there's, there's this part. I want to get too far ahead because I want to get to, to you here. Uh, but let me just say that there is, um, can a person, and here's a key question, Everybody runs for office today because we think politically, and it's easy to think that way. People say, well, vote for me because I'll change the world. <laughs> I'll make you happy. Yep. All right. Are we hearing that? Oh, who, yeah. who does? And I was in office, too. Now, I never made promises like that because they were lies, because they were things I couldn't do. But I would say, I will make my votes in accordance to God's word. Mm-hmm. I will follow the Ten Commandments of God's moral law, and I will not violate them. So I, I said those kind of things. But the, here's one that I would like to go to right now. This is one thing we know. God links, God links the righteous person and blessing to two things. The righteous person will do this. He will fear God and keep his commandments. The Ecclesiastes 12, 13 has a verse that says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring into judgment every work and every secret thing, whether it be good or bad. Mm-hmm. A righteous person can be identified by do they fear God. And that fear of God will be measured by do they uphold and keep God's moral law, his commandments, and so forth. That's number one. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 6. It also says, God says this, Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Basically the same thing Ecclesiastes said. Fear God, keep his commandments. Deuteronomy chapter 28, 1 through 3, then text and says, uh, says another thing that I think is of interest because God takes and says to a whole nation and to people as well, he says this, And it shall come to pass, If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, observe, keep his commandments, which I command you this day, the Lord thy God will set thee high above all the nations of the earth, and these blessings will come on thee. And then it talks about that, which is exactly what you had said earlier uh, about national blessings. So that's number two. Um, and And then the second thing is this. Fearing God is measured not only by God, but by the people. And I can't go into detail here because of the time. But in Romans 13, God lays out for all those in authority, they, number one, they must understand that they are God's minister. They are servants of God. That's vertical. That's fearing God. Their ability to keep God's commandments will be measured in how well they do and fulfill their relationship to the people as a servant of the people, not a tyrant. And that'll be measured in two ways. Do they punish the evil? break God's rule, and do they protect those who do well? That's the purpose of government. The most important thing, I think, though, is found, I believe, in Romans 13, verse 6, where it uses the word minister of God, but it's a Greek word, liturgos. Literally, it means to lead the people in worship of God. Ultimately, a righteous person in government will say, it's not about me, it's about God. What I do is not about me, it's about God. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Isaac, because I've talked about some righteous. I'm going to not give you very much time. We need to go into the end of the, we'll go there. But that is this. Then if that's the righteous and you can identify him and God sets it up and it goes even further, where God says, love the things that I love. And there's a whole list. The wicked. Mm -hmm. Can you identify the wicked? Yeah, and I wish people could see how much self-control we have when we're talking about these things because we could go into this for hours. But I love how you've broken it down so quickly, what what it means to be righteous. Um, Paul gives us a really good uh, spot on this in Romans chapter 6 about walking in newness of life. And in verses 17 and 18, he says, you are a slave or a servant either to God or to the flesh. Mm. And, uh, you know, we think of Jesus Christ. He's perfect. He's the only one that was ever perfect. Well, the opposite is, is Lucifer. 
He was a slave of his own control and desires, and every one of us has walked in our own sin. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned, we've walked after that, taking the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil and trying to be our own gods and build our own kingdoms. And so that's what the wicked does. The wicked person doesn't follow after God, but he follows after his or her own way, which is really the way of, of, that Cain went after his parents and the way that Lucifer uh, went. And uh, in Ezekiel, w- w- actually throughout the Old Testament, the prophets, they're the Old Testament preachers. Um, the, the preachers of the Old Testament warn about this, and they talk about the new covenant that is coming through Jesus Christ, the New Testament. Um, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 22, though, we see Ezekiel preaching and calling people out because of their wickedness. And he describes this wicked nation now, the nation that had been a nation after God. And he says um, that verse 25, Ezekiel 22, 25, says there's a conspiracy of her prophets. That's, that's the clergy, that's the preachers. Um, and he says that they are ra- uh, ravening prey. They are devouring souls. They're taking treasure. And then he goes into the priest. He says the priest have violated the law. They have profaned what was supposed to be holy. And then he goes into the princes. So he goes, prophets, preachers, uh, uh, prophets, priests, princes, they are like wolves ravening uh, to destroy souls and to get dishonest gain. And then the last P, and I like how he alliterates it, except this was translated, of course, into English. But then he goes into the people. And now the people have followed the leadership. In other words, the people are no better than their leadership. The leadership reflects what the people are doing. And the people um, have used oppression. They have exercised robbery and they have vexed the poor. And that's when he goes into what our our program is named after, the standing in the gap. He says, I sought for a man to stand in the gap. And he said, well, well, Ezekiel's prophesying, right? And Jeremiah is at that time prophesying. But what he's looking for is a man that can span the gap And the Mm. only one who can ever do that is going to be in that new covenant we have through Jesus Christ and Christ alone, because all of us will fall short. And so all of us are wicked by nature, but through Jesus Christ, through his kingdom, we have that righteousness that saves us and makes us like Jesus Christ. That's our ultimate rescue from that. So uh, as we look at this today, uh, righteous authority goes back to, to the word of God, the written word of God, the living word of God, Jesus Christ himself. We're going to take another quick time out. We'll be right back on Stand in the Gap. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV. Positively different. years, pastors have carried the light of the gospel through opposition, persecution, and every flaming arrow of the enemy. But sadly, now more than ever, our nation is experiencing a period of spiritual darkness. But what would happen if churches threw off the shackles of fear and boldly stood for truth? If 100,000 pastors around the nation joined together and committed to preaching God's Word no matter the consequence, pastors who are unaffected by changing times and the opinions of men, what would happen if America's pulpits became aflame with the preaching of righteousness? The great darkness from rejecting God's standards would be expelled, the prayers of God's people heard, our nation healed, and God's blessings restored. The time has come to stand.
Well, welcome back to Stand in the Gap today as we are talking. We're finishing up a, a, a time of just Sam and I talking to each other about when the righteous are ruling over a nation or even in a family, that the, the people are able to rejoice in it. But when the wicked, they mourn. And, and Sam, uh, on our Stand in the Gap Today radio program, we talked about elections, not just in America. Um, in the year 2024 it was a, it is a year of elections all over the world that were extremely important. And we looked at some you know ways that things are going and we, we kind of went through and talked about some different world leaders and things. But from the American point of view, looking at where America is right now, national and then even local levels, um, and we see this, you know, mourning under wicked leaders, where, where are we at? Where do you see us? Uh, what's kind of the trajectory that we've gone in the last few years? Well, Isaac, I think we are at a point in inflection mm. um, as a nation. Who do you not talk to? who feels confused, mm -hmm. mourning to some degree or another, questioning, having no idea, divided. Where does that come from? That is a mark of God's judgment. And what are we getting from those who are running primarily? Everybody's a savior. Everybody's a human savior. I can fix the problem. He can. He's the problem, not me. But at the end of the day, God's people... And this is our challenge, and this is a reason for talking about this, is that if we don't start thinking biblically, very quickly, we will, all that we now know will be a distant memory. Mm. Mm. Because no man can make America great. No man ever made America great. Mm. God alone made America great. Deuteronomy 8 is all, 20, all about that. And God's blessing is contingent upon the people and the rulers doing two things, fearing God, keeping His commandments, thinking biblically, understanding they're going to give an account to God one day. And so they resist their ability, their the power to abuse the office and abuse the people. They don't get involved in bribery and corruption. They avoid the pride. They invite all these things and they do what the Bible says because then God says, if that happens, then I will hear. Mm. But we're out of time. Ladies and gentlemen, we, we thank you for watching us today. But I hope just a little bit of a thinking here. The world would have us to think that all of the answers are in somebody or some political system. It's not. That's where all the trouble is. Our answers are in the Word of God. And there's God who is the one alone who can bless. In Deuteronomy, go back and read Deuteronomy chapter 28. If you've not done it, you will hear it very clearly. Fear, God says, fear me, keep my commandments, and I'll pour out so many blessings. Our nation has experienced that. He said, but you turn your back on me, I'll turn the blessings into judgment, and they will flee faster. They'll come upon you faster than you can run. Let's think biblically and approach these elections from God's perspective.